it. And let me go over what we're talking about today. So why do people fail at whole sign? So what I'd like to do is you guys put in some comments. What do you think the top two or three reasons are why people fail in whole sign? I already know the answer to this. Why? I've been through the journey. I have walked so many people through this fire. I know exactly what people are going on inside their head. I know what they're concerned with. And I know why most people can't get past the first 30 or 90 days in wholesaling. So I would love to see comments in there because if you understand it, even though it's a lot of rudimentary answers, if you understand the psychology of how wholesalers think when they start out, it's actually, this took me a long time to accept. And it, what, so a lot of your answers are right. I'm not going to say lazy. Consistency is always going to be a problem. So I'm not going to go to consistency. La Listen, if you're lazy, you'll never survive as a wholesaler. Don't even um, worry about that. Analysis paralysis. Yeah. F I see a lot of fear on there. This is a good one. Lack of commitment. Um, discipline. So guys, keep the answers coming because we are going to put them in priority. So I'm going to let you guys kind of write today's live because it's important you understand because I know the secret of why mechanically when you come from another industry and you try wholesaling and you fall in love with it and you go, oh my God, this guy Rick and Zach, like it's an amazing lifestyle and I want it. But it's never a question if you don't want what's on the other side of the lifestyle. The question is, are you willing to go through the fire to get it? And the honest answer to most people, it's just a no. And people can't be honest with themselves and do it. How many times do you see when people see like a movie star or an actor or a famous athlete, like, oh my God, I'd love to have what they have. But what you don't understand is they gave up a lot to get it. And my question is always going to be is, what are you going to give up to become successful in wholesaling? Honestly, if everybody who jumped in wholesaling was successful, it would not be this incredible path to create financial freedom and freedom of your time. So you have to understand that. Jason, get real close here. They try for two months. I'd probably give, that's probably one more month than what most people even actually do. Um, connections, that's a part of it, but it's not everything. Most of your connections are going to be with motivated sellers when you do it. <laughs> so, Annabella says, because I'm trying to figure out why I've done four deals and now I'm stuck. Now, Annabella, you've done more than most people have on average. So a lot of time is you're trying to reinvent the wheel, what we're doing. But Annabella, I want you to be part of this stream today because I'm here to help you out. So if you want to hop on the live, I would love to talk to someone like you. And listen, guys, you don't have to put your video on the live. I'm here to help problem solve. And we go from there. So, um, Oh, that, this is a big one. Oh my God. Listen, when you've worked for somebody else, I worked for a corporation for 12 years and then I went on my own and worked virtually. I mean, it was like naked and afraid all over again. Like if you ever watched that show, the two biggest fears of people is to live out in the wild and be naked with a stranger with like no like modern day supplies. To me, that's a horror story. So I kind of get it on that. <laughs> Used to work. It's true, man. A lot of you guys are addicted to the paycheck. I know I was. I was like, what do you mean I'm not getting a paycheck on the 15th? I got a paycheck on the 15th and the 1st, and then I got my commissions on the 1st. And that that was it. When I had to change that, it was crazy. So awesome. So I'm seeing discouragement, fear of making a mistake. And by the way, every one of your answers are absolutely correct. So let me go through my answers, and we will walk through this together um working in, in a sales full-time and trying to make you some skills in corporate life that won't stop you it gets in the way but it won't stop you so let me run through it and by the way i don't do these in order uh, there is no one that's more important than the other but these are the things that i always find so the first thing i'm going to talk about is the mechanical in the mind because the reality is most of you have tried the other side of the matrix on the, on the, like the matrix and you're stuck in it. And when I say the matrix, this corporate BS cycle, we're all stuck on, let's go to work. Let's, uh, let's get a good job. Let's get good pay and take care of our family. And that's what most people are subscribed to. That's what we're all pitched. Your modern day school systems from K through 12th grade is all about getting you a job. 
every piece of vocabulary, everything in print is how are you going to get a good job if you don't do this? How are you going to get a good job if you don't get good grades? And in my opinion, like I didn't realize this young, they're already breaking you down to be a soldier for the matrix. And what happened to free thinking to people that could actually create companies and entrepreneurs that can help solve the world's problems? Now, the reality is your government wants you to be a soldier. They want you to go to work so they can get access to your taxes. The more people that contribute to the tax system, the more dollars they take. They don't generate revenue. They take. And then they, politicians, spend our money. And that's why we're in a $32 trillion deficit, because there is no checks and balances on anything. So if you subscribe to that, you have to understand it does take time to unwind your mind. I'm here to tell you, I got stuck so bad on this, it, it absolutely destroyed my mind. So the first thing is, when something doesn't work, you've got to understand, is you're operating under your old mindset while you're doing wholesaling. I'm going to go through in detail with this. Remember, if what you did before is completely broken, broken, and they've programmed you to be a job, be a good employee, and follow the rules, there's no way that mindset will ever work in wholesaling. And I'm here to tell you, you actually have to do almost the complete freaking opposite. So we all get frustrated when we don't make money from day one. We don't get results in 30 days. And we go back to our old self and we get super frustrated. Keep in mind, your old self's what brought you to this current moment. So if you're out of shape or you're overweight, if you use your old mindset and try to make a change your body, you're going to wind up right back or if not worse than when you started. And if you understand that going into wholesaling, you have to give yourself a little bit of space to make some mistakes because the truth of wholesaling, it's about learning making mistakes and making money. But you've been brought up in a school system where you have to study, study, you have to ace a test and only the A students will get the best jobs. And then everybody at a B minus or a C plus, I was more like a C minus, you've got to go do manual work jobs because you're not smart enough to get it done. They never taught you about working hard, about working smart, anything like that. So if you take that old mindset, the wholesaling, it will destroy you. You're going to have to do some work on your mind saying everything I've done to that point that has frustrated me has not worked. So when me and Zach give you instructions on stuff you have to do and you start saying, well, I don't want to do that or that seems like too many phone calls, you are using your broken old mindset and you're looking for safety and certainty and I cannot give that to you in wholesaling. And if that's what you're here for, get out right away because you're going to be in for a culture shock. You're going to have to take a risk. You're going to have to take such uncomfortable action. It's going to shake you to the core. But if you can get through that, the life you can lead on the other side of it is nothing like you can even possibly imagine because you think there's this wall that you're going to hit. Here's why people take jobs for the most part. And by the way, I've had plenty of jobs, so I'm not a hypocrite. We want safety. We want security. We want certainty. It is one of the biggest human emotions needs. You're going to have to leave that at the door. It doesn't mean you're reckless and forget about it. Guys, keep in mind, I worked a corporate job for almost eight months before I quit and left wholesaling completely. Huge mortgage, two, two tiny little babies, and a wife depending on me. So I don't matter what position you're in. If you're living at home with your parents or you have the scenario like I have, you deserve better because getting little peanuts Every couple of weeks, you're working on somebody else's dream. And I'm here to tell you, the only way things can get better if you work on your own dreams. If you found wholesaling through me, God bless you. I want to help you out as much as possible. You're going to have to change that old broken mindset because it just doesn't work. And I'm here to tell you, if you rely on that old broken mindset for your new change, you're going to repeat the exact same patterns. You're going to quit wholesaling and you're going to run back to safety. Here's a little deal I made with myself. I go, I know this is going to be hard. I know this is going to be wildly uncomfortable. And honestly, I'm going to have a lot of fear, anxiety, and I'm going to be scared. But if I don't make this change, when am I ever going to do it? And worst case scenario, if I give it a year, maybe even two years, and it fails, I will go back to the bottom of the ladder on my corporate ladder, and I'll just work my way back up. 
you can always go back to your old self. You already know it and it's there. And honestly, it's what's created your problem. You're comfortable with it. Your new mindset is wildly uncomfortable. It's exciting, but man, it scares the hell out of you. And if you will not cross that bridge, I can't help you. Zach can't help you. Nobody can help you. I can give you word for word exactly what to do. And you're going to let your old broken mindset bring you back in. So that's number one. Number two, excuses. Man, dude, I was good at this. I was good at this. The minute you find yourself giving excuses, dig deep. Dig deep as you possibly can down to your heart and your soul. And I'm here to tell you, excuses are validation for why you don't want to do something. It's a defense mechanism. You guys hear excuses all day. I can't stand excuses. I am numb to people's excuses. To be honest with you, I was an excuse producer for a long time. Once you own up to it and go, that, well, that's not going to help me by making an excuse. Are there valid excuses? Yeah. I know people that for no reason at all get stuck in a situation for something they didn't do. The difference is some people cry excuses all day and they want sympathy or they want to be given a break. You have a choice. You can either give an excuse or you can take action, period. Even when things go wrong, not to your fault, you have to remove excuses because excuses are explanations to validate your story of why you can't get something done. If you constantly give excuses, it means you're not going to get anything done. And once I identify that person, I move past them because I don't want to waste my time with them anymore. Don't be that person. I used to have excuses. Once you own up to it and you're truly accountable to yourself, excuses don't matter. Excuses is just wasted air. Excuses don't change anything. You are trying to validate your feelings. And unfortunately, other people just don't care. So excuses are actions. You have to pick which one you do. You can't do both. It's impossible to do both. So every time I'm talking to you guys and people give me, I, I can't do this. I can't do that. My favorite is I tried everything, Rick. If you want to bring me that line, I promise you in a couple minutes, I can probably bust it open because trying everything would mean we probably wouldn't be having this conversation if you truly tried everything because that means you did everything. And the word try is one of the biggest hints I hear from people. Try is not an action. It's an attempt. Trying is an is an attempt. It's not an action. The word trying to me is like an excuse. Well, I tried, Rick. I tried. I'm trying. What does that mean? Does it mean you're going to get it done? Which leads me to the next one. If you want to avoid the word try or I'm trying, understand this. A lot of wholesalers fail because they have a belief without conviction. So what do I mean by that? This is really simple. When you have a belief you go, listen, I believe wholesaling will set me financially free and free up my time to spend more time with my family and my loved ones. That's a belief. I love it. It was my belief. I wrote it on my bathroom mirror. You guys know the story. Now, here's the problem. That belief is internalized with you. Maybe your spouse, your family knows about it. Maybe a couple of friends and colleagues. That's about it. Once you go out into the real world, they don't care about your belief because it's your belief, your conviction is your willingness to follow through your belief in, in absence of evidence to support it. Oh, I know that was a big definition. I don't even know how I spit that out. The truth of the matter is conviction is I'm going to do this no matter what it takes, period. End of story. If I got to knock on 3,000 doors, if I got to make 10,000 phone calls, I'm going through it. And until I get there, I'm not going to stop. The reality is if you have a belief that wholesaling is going to set you free and whatever you want to accomplish. And the minute your neighbor or your friend or family goes, what are you doing that crap for? That's ridiculous. Go get a regular job. Stop trying to be special because you're not. You need to make sure you provide for your family and you need the basics for them. And if you don't have a conviction, you're going to sabotage your own belief and you're going to wind back up into your former self. Ask me how I know this. I've had people attack me my entire life career doing wholesaling to this day. I don't care. So once you have a conviction, you can't penetrate the belief. The belief alone, it's like a jellyfish. It's very soft 
And until you surround it with your protective layer going, dude, I'm doing this. I don't care what happens. End of story. You are going to be at massive risk for failing and wholesaling. And guys, I'm telling you over and over, it is huge. So guys, there's a link to join the live. Um, just go up to the top where it says Rick Ginn. And uh, I'm going to be getting it in here shortly. So next, belief without conviction. Guys, I, it's what that, that would be the one I would hang it on there. Okay, persistence. I know it's just like a generic word. What persistence means to me as a wholesaler, when you get knocked down, you just get up. You don't even dust yourself up. You just got to snap up. You can't sit there and lay on the ground and cry foul, come up with excuses and question, why am I doing wholesaling? Just get up. It's not if you're going to get knocked down, it's how many times you're going to get knocked down. Remember, I don't know as the famous saying, it doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down. It matters how many times you get up. Everybody gets knocked down on wholesaling. You are not any exception. And if you think you're never going to get knocked down, get out the door now because you're about to get run over and wholesale it. it. Guys, this is truth. And a lot of this stuff is right up in here between your ears. Now, I'm going to throw out a big one. I might hurt some feelings on this, but you ready for this one? You guys care too, too much what others think of you. Like, honestly, guys, if somebody would not take the time of day to show up to your funeral and spend time with your loved ones to console them, why do you care what they think about what you're doing? Honestly, most people are just judging you because that's human nature. They are not there when you're paying your bills, when you're trying to take care of your family or doing anything like that. So you have to understand it. Stop caring what other people think about you. It doesn't mean you don't love them. It just means that I'm not going to let it affect me and take away my belief. My conviction so strong, I'm not going to let that change. Because the reality is most of the people that are judging you and the ones that you care the most about what they think about you, they're trying to protect you. And how do they protect you is don't do that. That's risky. Well, we already know where the job winds up. That's the biggest risk you can take in life because it guarantees you mediocrity. It guarantees a limit on how much you're going to make. And it guarantees you are going to spend a lot of time outside your family and your loved ones in your home. And to me, that is the risky venture of it all. And remember, I didn't figure that out until I was 33. So I'm not a hypocrite. I was brainwashed just like most of you guys that are watching this. It's just the truth. That's why we call it the matrix. So if you know that and people go, well, I wouldn't do that. Like, that's way risky. Why not take the money right now? I, I just, I don't get it. And if you are going to let somebody that is not doing what you want to do, that only, that has no financial stability, that just has the basics and gets bias in life. If that's what you want, then stay there. I'm fine with it. But if you've decided you want to make a change and you want to use wholesaling as your vehicle, then go with it and stop taking the advice and opinion from people that honestly, I get it. The loved ones are trying to protect you because they're scared and they don't understand why you take such a massive risk. But remember, the biggest risk is just not being free. You're only on this earth so, so long. So why sit there and be into a confined lifestyle? There is so much more out there. But if you just want to be average, wholesaling is probably not going to be the place for you because there's much easier methods to do it. So stop caring what everybody else thinks about you because they only think about it for a minute or two and then they go on, they go watch Kim Kardashian or whatever the next show is and they go to their nine to five job and then like they look forward to the weekends, they consume massive amounts of drinks, they eat whatever they want. If you don't want to be that person and you want to start to make a change, stop letting other people validate what you should be doing. So if you're not happy with what they're doing, why would you take advice from them? You guys, I mean, I own hypocrite of, I let my family and my friends for the longest time say, why would you do that? It's so risky. It's dangerous. And after a while, I figured out the only risky thing is sitting and working for somebody else. Guys, I'm not knocking when somebody works for somebody else. I did it for a long time, but you are on a wholesaling channel. And most likely you're interested in making a change in your life. Understanding you are going to do what 95% of the public completely disagrees with you. So do you want to live like that three to 5% of people? That's your option. 
or you can just accept the mediocrity of 95% of the people out there. And if you're like me, forget it. Hopefully you're younger than me. I didn't wake up till I was 33, guys. I tried everything that my family and my parents put in front of me, and it was a disaster. I got a good job, stuff like that. But like by the end of the day, by the time you pay your taxes and stuff, how much money do you really have? Do you think going on vacation for two weeks out of your life is living it up? Now, if you really commit to wholesaling, you get through your first two years, you can treat the rest of your life like a vacation. Two years, trade off two years. But in that two years, you can't be going on cruises. You can't go out partying every night. And you're going to have to make sacrifices and stop buying all that crap to keep up with the Joneses. So let's get into just some of the basics. Here's the last two uh, talking about mechanical and wholesaling. I will tell you, most of you have a lack of marketing problem because when you start from zero, you have to go crazy marketing. You have to contact everybody. I mean, everybody, because you went from nothing to a previous job to trying to do as many deals as possible. It does take some time. And that leads me to lack of volume. You got to have a tremendous amount of volume. A lot of time when I talk to you guys on the one-on-one, -on -one, the biggest problem I find is you just don't have enough lead. And I get it. And keep in mind, you need to talk to motivated sellers, talking to retail sellers. You have to disqualify as many as you can as soon as possible. Because if you think you're going to convince a retail person, maybe on like uh, a Fisbo Zillow to sell your home, and you think you... It, you can talk them into an hour. I'm telling you right now, 21 years of this, you will never force someone to sell a deal to you at a wholesale price. Either they fit the mold and they're confident in you and you can move forward with it. So guys, that is my rant on um, why most wholesalers fail. I know it's a lot. 90% of the game is right up here in the head. They just can't get through their head that they're operating under the old set of rules. So if you're going to enter the matrix, you know, the red pill, blue pill, you have to take a choice. You can't be on both sides of the matrix and make it work. You're worried about what others think to you, then stay over on that side. Because on this side, it's a completely different set of rules. And it's really difficult the first three to six months trying to figure it out. Sometimes it's difficult the first year. And here's the last one I want to tell you is the marathon Oh, I'm sorry. Wholesaling is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Everybody I've been in this business 21 years, any wholesaler I've ever met that did the sprint, they all leave. They all leave and go do something else. They try to make as much money as fast as they can. They get out and they say they hate it. If you hate the business, it means you did it wrong. There's nothing to hate, guys. I'm on 21 years. I love everything I do. If you like working with people and talking to people, that's all wholesaling is. Real estate is just a mathematical side problem of people. So I look for clues where there's issues and that's where I go in on it. So, um, so somebody put on here, what do we do after wholesale? Wholesaling is just a fundamental entry point. So the reality is you can do anything you want. You can do buy and holds on rental properties. You can do hotel properties. Some of you guys do fix and flips. I strongly advise against that because it's kind of a sucker's bet because you have to speculate to a point. But if you want to fix and flip on wholesale deals you bought, you can do that. You can do the Airbnb route. And a lot of people switch to commercial. And then you can also do creative financing. Now, I'm here to tell you, creative financing is a natural progression from a wholesaler. The reason why I don't push creative financing up front is because a lot of people in today's society think they can just skip wholesaling Creative finance is going to be easier because I pay people exactly what they want. The problem with that, that's somewhat true, but if you don't learn the core part of wholesaling and you just start pay paying people what they want for their properties, how are you going to make money? If you do a creative financing deal where you pay someone exactly what they want for the property, which you paid at retail or above, you're going to have to wait years down the road before that thing ever cash flows and even make money. So you're going to have to go back and get get a job. And when you start a wholesaling, that's kind of what it is. And a lot of people say wholesaling is a job. I, it's probably the highest paying job I've ever seen in my life. I, I constantly made 50 to 70 grand a month wholesaling when I was relatively new. So I'm okay with that type of job. And I would love to introduce that to you. And then if you want to collect creative financing while you're doing it, great. Creative financing is not a shortcut to wholesaling. 
So a lot of people buy courses going, well, creative financing is easier because I don't have to compete with the wholesalers. You're wrong on that. It's an absolute, that's a fabricated lie to sell you a course. Creative financing is not easier. Creative financing takes time and experience. And a lot of your creative financing leads will come naturally from your wholesaling leads. And the longer you learn to talk to people and, and convert and have conversations with them and build great rapport, creative financing gets easier. But there's a time and place for creative financing. Trying to shove everybody in creative financing is not a great way to attack the business. So I don't want someone thinking, I hear it all the time. Well, I'm going to do creative financing because I was told it's much easier in wholesaling. Do you know how many people are in creative financing now? It's a lot. And my question is, creative financing to me only works if you can withstand the long run weight. So if you got to come up 20, 30 grand, which is very common in creative financing, if you don't have that kind of money, you got to get into deals with little to no money. And they do exist, but a lot of newbies don't know how to identify them. And if you don't understand the core basics of wholesaling and real estate investing, jumping to creative financing, that's like learning algebra before you learn math. Now, I'm not saying you can't do it, but everybody wants that core basics. We learned writing, reading, spelling, and basic arithmetic before we did algebra and calculus. And the problem with most creative financing is if you're starting out with no money, if you don't make money from day one on your creative financing, what is your plan to pay somebody twenty, thirty thousand dollars of property? You're going to run out of money. You're going to run out of time. And markets do shift and change. And I rather you make money in wholesaling and learn how to talk to people and understand how a wholesale mechanic deal works. And then when a deal comes up where there's little to no equity in it and they need to sell the property and you can do like a subject to a wrap or a lease option, that is the perfect time to do it. It's not from day one because you saw this course where you don't have to compete with wholesalers and you think it's a shortcut. It is a huge, to me, I just think it's irresponsible to do it that way. But that's my opinion. It stays with me. And that's why we do it on the Rick Ginn channel. But uh, I love creative financing. But I will tell you, I had to see hundreds of scenarios before I understood what to do, when to do, and how to do it. And honestly, once I mastered wholesaling, creative financing came naturally. If I tried to master wholesaling and creative financing all in the same like 90 days, my brain would have probably exploded. But once again, that is me. So, um, okay, so let's jump on, do some lives. Um, we got plenty of time. So if you're on there, my God, you guys already filled it up. So um, let's work our way. I'm stuck. Why is that not going up? Okay, there it is. Okay, let's pick somebody I haven't talked to here before. Crystal, are you there? I am. Hi. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. What's going on? Well, I appreciate you. We all do. Thank you for this. Okay. What's going on, Crystal? Let's help you out. What's going on? Thank you. Here's what's going on. So I'm in my first wholesale deal and it's in West Palm Beach. Ooh. And I'm, I have not been able to find a cash buyer. Um, I took your coaching and I asked for, it's amazing, um, proof of funds. And very few people have that. So they were fellow wholesalers. <laughs> um, it's frustrating, <laughs> isn't it? Oh my gosh, it was shocking. Yeah. I was so excited until I realized no, they're they're not cash buyers. Um and so, that's a big that's a big problem right now. Hey, can is. you turn your computer down there a little bit because I'm getting um like feedback on it. Oh yes. Okay. Okay. So um I talked with Zach last night. I was on live with him. And he said to send the contract in. I did. And I have like three days left. I'm continuing to call and, and look. Um, I did get a, a text from the real estate agent. I don't know how to answer her. And I have a question about walkthroughs virtually because I'm in Tennessee, All right. probably right. in Florida. So she said to me, are you planning on doing uh, the inspection? And the inspection period is up. On Wednesday, I don't even know how to answer her because this is my okay. <laughs> so Crystal, you know, I'm always, I'm always going to tell you the truth. I'm getting horrible feedback on your, uh, 
You got the volume down there? I do. Is that okay. better? Is that better? Um, yeah, I'm still getting a little bit. So let, let me walk you through this quickly because you spoke to Zach a little bit and he has a little bit more information on this. So I'm excited that you're actually taking action. I assume you got this. Did you get this on market like an MLS deal? It is on market. So you know the risk with doing on market, right? What is they're the risk? They're a pain in the butt. Like I tell everybody up front, I am not a big fan of doing them. I'm not saying you can't do it. It is much easier up front. It feels really good. You get contracts right. accepted pretty easily. The reality is the back end is usually a nightmare. And I, I'm telling you this because I need you. I need to make sure you're covered here. Okay. So does the realtor understand what you're trying to do? And this is just between you and me and everybody um, else watching. Uh, I'm not sure. Actually, she knows I want to assign the contract because I made sure the contract was written that way. Got it. So how long was your inspection period? 10 days. It's really, really a tight window. I'm not going to lie to you. T 10 days, even in my operation in Florida, is a huge challenge. And I have a vetted, fully ready to go cash buyers list because it has to be a smoking deal to get people to take action in today's, in today's market. And that's the real challenge. And I'm just telling you guys, most people, you try to get 30 days, you can get that in off market. Trying to get 30 days on an on market deal with a realtor, it's almost impossible. Like, I'm just telling you, it has to, how long was the property on the market for? It was on the market for 75 days. It's on the market right now for 810 and we got it at 627. Okay. So they had it listed for 810, right? Correct. So the other challenge is obviously it's not worth 810 because nobody made an offer at that number. So did you run any ARVs on this before you made the offer on the property? I did. The and what'd you ARV come up with? Is, it's about 840. It needs flooring and it has an old roof. And what part of uh, Palm Beach, what city is it located in? It's located in uh, the acreage. Okay. So I know that area well. Um, they're a little bit more spread out. Um, it's a particular type of person that likes to buy it because how much land does it have with it? And 1.15 uh, acres and a separate two-story structure, office on the top, three-car garage on the bottom. Does the realtor say why, why it's not selling? They're in the middle of an ugly divorce and he's been uncooperative and she moved out with the kids and he's staying on a mattress in the, in the family room and okay. it's a mess. So I got it with our disposition people actually tonight. So Zach made mention of this and he put it in a tickler file. So I haven't looked at it. So I want to look through it, but I'm just, I'm going to give you some general information and then we'll okay. give you a little bit before you guys got to be Thank careful you. with on market properties because you're dealing with realtors. And here's the rule. If I set like an ARV, like you said, at 840, it's been on the market at 810. I assume they did some sort of price reductions as it was listed over the 75 days. It was on for a million and, <laughs> and they've inched it down. Yes. So, um, the problem is your ARV can never exceed what is is on the current market because the current market is the ultimate litmus test of what a property is worth. If you put it out on the market, if you put it out on an 810 and nobody owned it for 810 and then you get it at like 600, that's great. But you still got to figure out what it's worth. Have you figured out what the property needs for repairs to get it in, you know, finished shape? Um, about 50000 with flooring and with the roof and paint. That's the best I can do. I haven't seen it myself. Yeah. Um, I got so, an inspection on it. How many, how many square feet, how many square feet under air is that property? It's uh 3,400 square feet, the main house, mm -hmm. and then a separate structure, 1200 square feet, two stories. Okay. That's interesting. Um, and then what did you say as far as an inspection? We have an inspection um, and they said that it's going to need a new roof in a couple of years. Um, it's got some odds and ends things, uh, but nothing 
I mean, nothing structural or it's all so it's, pretty much cosmetic. How old is the roof? Um, actually, there is a hard water stain in the bathroom. The roof's 20 years old. So that's going to be another one of your big problems. Do you have a, a estimated cost for the roof? I no, I have a guesstimate from a real estate agent, not ours, but another one uh, of twenty thousand. Is it a tile barrel or is it is it shingle or tile or what is the material? I think it's shingle. So to do thirty four hundred, and then there's another separate property for twelve hundred. That has a new roof. So okay, that's so a thirty four hundred. So I'm going to tell you, you're way light on the twenty grand because unfortunately I do a lot of roofs. I just a okay. little, I just a little, little tiny, nine hundred square foot home, and it cost me eleven grand. So I'm just telling you, it's going to be closer to thirty to thirty five for the roof. Okay. So your your challenge is, is even if the roof's fine especially in South Florida insurance companies don't want to insure a home with a roof that's more than 15 years old. It's a nightmare here. And a little known fact across the country, the insurance company is trying to change to where after 10 years, you got to get the roof changed because insurance companies don't, they don't want to cover anybody. So I will tell you, you're going to have to factor the cost of the roof in there. Okay. Normally we don't get these houses inspected. We walk through it ourselves. We walk through our cash partners or something like that. The biggest problem you have is this really tight window. I'm not going to lie to you. So how long before the, the closing scheduled on it? The 3rd of May. So, uh, okay. Let me look at the numbers. But guys, I want you guys to understand this is the problem when you do with the on-market. The 10 days is challenging. And you've, you have got to pay attention to your, um, your end of your inspection period. Here's what I would ask. If you want to just give it a Hail Mary and give it a shot. How many days are you in the inspection? You got only three days left, right? Yeah, we've been in seven days. Okay. I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to have to put the roof in the play. I guarantee that property won't be sold until somebody re-roofs it. And every cash buyer is going to want to say the same thing. Because all you have to do is look on public record and you can see the age of the roof. So if the roof's 20 years old, we're in 2023. That means in 2003, and we've been through four or five hurricanes in Florida. So that roof is well past its prime. And you said you saw a water stain somewhere? Uh, no, hard water stain uh, in the bathroom, master bath. On the floor or the ceiling? Um, well, the real estate agent, uh, I don't know. I have no idea where it is. She so looked at the pictures and yeah. she said there was a hard water stain. I would estimate your repairs minimum. Just what you're telling me is at least a hundred grand. And it's probably 115 by the time you do all the cosmetic because big houses, it costs a lot more to fix them up. So wow. we at freeholesaling.com, we give you a, a repair chart and that thing is like 3000 plus square feet. Go in there and look at it. And I just went over there with someone yesterday. You've got to go through those numbers and kind of understand the more square footage, everything costs more. The amount of flooring for 3000 square foot, it just adds up. You're missing okay. the roof. I guarantee the roof's a problem. Okay. So I would go back and say, listen, would you, I've looked at the roof. I can't get insurance on this property. It's a challenge. So what I'd like to do is extend it out another seven to 10 days to get an accurate um, number on it. Would you be willing to do that? If she has no other offers, they might be willing to do that. And okay. then I got to look at this, but I'm going to be honest with you. There's only so much I can do in two or three days. Like, I understand. I, I'm somewhat of a miracle worker, but I'm not crazy. I because totally the challenge understand. is being the acreage. It's a little bit different out there. So, so just so you know, it's a little bit more spread out. It's a little bit more like you're used to in Tennessee, which is an oddball in Florida, a little bit. Yeah. Some people like, it, but it doesn't have as big of an audience for it, and that's the challenge. So I know it's going to take a little bit more time to sell it, and then honestly. If we decide to do something with you, I would send my realtor in there. And I love to take a realtor's first reaction when they go in there because they come back and they just tell you the truth. They go, Rick, it's ugly. It needs 150 grand or something like that because yeah. that's how people buy properties. I believe you're missing something on this property because then list it from a million down to what, 640? Uh, 27, 627. Who missed the mark there? Because that's a ginormous difference. It's a new real estate agent. I think she did. And she said he was very difficult. So he was 
you know, pie in the sky kind of guy. Yeah. So 640 is not bad, but like it really depends on what it looks at. So I'm going to look at with Zach later tonight and I'll, we'll reach out to you. I assume you got all your contact information, but like I cannot change on market properties. This is the challenge because seven, somebody had a seven day the other day. I'm like, just get out of it. I, there's no way I can get a cash buyer in there. 10 days, really hard. So whenever you do on market properties, try to focus on a minimum 15 and make sure you're getting a great deal and make sure the realtor knows you're assigning it. So you did a good job with that and you're being transparent and which I like because a lot of times when we try to hide stuff from the realtor, it just creates massive pain for everybody involved. I don't, yes. I never lie to realtors because I just don't have the energy or the time to like do yes. all that. Crap. So let me look at the numbers. I'll dive into it, but just. In the future, I want you to focus on off-market stuff. And where are you in Tennessee, by the way? Jackson. Okay. So I don't know everything about Tennessee, but I have a lot of people that do very well in Tennessee, like extremely well. And I'm here to tell you, most Florida people wind up going in your neck of the woods. So how did you wind up picking up Florida as your virtual market? Um. It was a fluke. We met someone in another investment club and she had just moved to Florida. Uh -huh. uh, she, she had a real estate agent who bought her apartment, you know, with her. And she said, I have a great deal. If you're getting into wholesaling, why don't you look at this? So we were partners. We couldn't find a buyer the first time we were in contract for 850. Mm -hmm. And so she pulled out, we have 1% earnest money. And then uh, I just sat on it. I just kept, I sent a certified mail offer, uh -huh. uh, which didn't get responded to. And then a month later, I kept texting the real estate agent. She said, okay, they'll take your offer. So we went to 627-770. Okay. Let, let me take a look at it. I don't want to tie up any more on this live. Okay. And honestly, even if your contract doesn't, I might have a strategy for you because I've done this multiple times where we pull your contract out, we put in mine, we go for a much deeper discount. But these, unfortunately, this type of properties, is it vacant or is anybody living in it? Well, he's staying on a mattress in the family room. <laughs> okay. He would be a great subject too. He's got 11 liens on the property. He's got a terrible rating. He's a construction. He has uh -huh. a construction company. He's in terrible shape. In the middle of a divorce, he's desperate. And okay. Yeah, that's his situation. So do me a favor. Um, if you want, you uh, my email support at Flip with Rick. If if you can put um, Crystal in all caps in the title. Okay. And then offer me any additional information so when I look at it, I I can like process everything. Because when okay. you talk about like eleven leads, it's a lot of information. Whatever you can sum up in there, why you think that might be a good candidate. Okay. And let's look at it and see if the way there's attack it. Listen, they want to sell it. You're finding the right type of realtor. It's just you got squeezed because it was on market. Because the time frame, there's like, there's a deal to be had, but like we got to get the truth of the property to create a win-win situation for everybody involved. So you're Thank saying you. the husband lives in the property and I assume the wife's out of there, the, the soon-to-be yes. ex-wife? Yes. And she's probably the reasonable one and he's probably the difficult one, right? Yes. They're just like a normal man, right? <laughs> I feel so, bad for both of them. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're it's, really yeah, it's a challenge. Okay. Send me that email. I will look at the, uh, the file you submitted yesterday and then I will sit down with Zach and see if we can put something together with it, but please pay attention to that expiration date. Okay. Because I don't know if that's the right number and I'm being brutally honest with you because there's okay. a, that's the problem when stuff on MLS, everybody plays the game. And the, the only challenge is the acreage. And so there's a smaller buyer pool out there. Some people don't want to be out there in the middle. of It's not the middle of nowhere. It's nothing like that. But there's a lot of space and a lot of people don't like to take care of that land, even though an acre doesn't seem like a lot, especially people from Tennessee. But that's a lot of land in Florida. So can I ask you two quick questions? Before let's go. You know? Yes. Do you think um, you could look at it and let me know by tomorrow? Is that unrealistic? Yes. I'll give you an honest answer. And honestly, I'm just going to tell you the truth because you don't have any time to waste. You don't have time for a Thank sales so pitch. Much. And I'm just going to tell you, you are at risk on MLS deals with a very short inspection. So I'm leaning towards protecting you okay. more than telling you to move forward. And I'm going to tell you that up front. So you have clarity when you 
in this live with me. Thank but you. I'll look into it. But just because you're in your contract doesn't mean you don't you lose the battle, but you can come back to win the war because okay. nobody else is bidding on this property. Right. So one of the things you want to reach out to the, the realtor, is it a young realtor, older realtor? Young. Say, so listen, have you had any activity with the pro Like, have you had any other activity since I spoke to you? And I always ask them, what is the real problem with this property in your opinion? And just have her give you as much information as you can and just don't panic her. But if you can help me get that information, okay. we can try to put it together on paper. And then if it warrants a visit with somebody in my company, we'll go out and take a look at it and see if we can make the numbers work. Awesome. Uh, last okay. question. Yes. Inspection. So she wanted to know if I have an intention for an inspection. I wasn't quite sure how to answer that. So um, the, the reality is most people's inspections is they either hire a home inspector. That's what a retail buyer does. Or usually you or your partner walks through it and does like kind of the kick the tires, maybe even with a contractor that's a friend. Yep. And your reason say, listen, I'm having a, I'm having a real challenge finding someone to help me take a look at that roof. This is a spot where you can go, listen, can you just give me an extra seven days? Cause it's challenging in South Florida to find qualified people to help me do the inspection. Okay. She might even like offer you someone, but that's the time to ask for an inspection. But keep in mind, the realtor could care less if you get an extension on the inspection, it's the sellers that have to agree to it. So that's a great time to get Intel from her because I think they want an offer bad, but I'm concerned that you have a, a it sounds like a, a sketchy contractor with 11 liens on the property. Um, so do you have any idea what the mortgage is on the property? It's 404. So someone's still going to have to pay off the liens. So any, uh, how much 48, are the liens? 48,000. 48,000. And then, you know, it just depends if the seller is real reasonable what they, they expect to get out of that deal when they walk away. Because mm -hmm. someone's going to have to cash out the liens because you have to, because those people want to get paid or they're going to foreclose on the property. And then someone like that is a lot of times you got to write a check for anywhere from 20, 30, 40 grand. And then you do the repairs. Now you're talking about $130,000. So it gets a little bit challenging. Send me that email. I'll put it all together and I'll give you an instant answer. Thank okay? you so much. Okay. okay. You're doing good. Just keep working. Go and look for off market properties and also look around Tennessee because Tennessee is a wonderful state to invest in. Your prices Thank are you. much more reasonable and you don't have to go far to find it. So I just want to open your eyes up. But you're taking action, which I love. So keep doing it, okay? Thank you very much. Thanks, Crystal. Okay. okay. Have a blessed day. Okay. Bye bye. All right. <laughs> uh, let's see here. So that's the challenge with on market properties, guys. And you've got to understand that going into that. So, Joshua, what's going on, man? Oh, we're hanging in there. We're doing good. We're doing Okay. Um, are you able to hear me? I hear you perfectly. What's going on? What can I help you out with? So I run into uh, quite a bit of issues here. Uh, I've had canceled contracts and I had cancel one more yet today. Um, and I'm kind of into get to spot with a lot of buyers. The Go through. I talk to them at least once a month to see where they're buying and stuff like that. Hey Joshua, hold one second. Our connection is horrible. Like I'm getting every third word you say. Can you just check your connection? And here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to one person. And I'm gonna come back to you. But it's really hard every third word. It's not you. We just got to figure out the connection. So I don't know if it's on your side or my side. And then you're also getting stuck on your screen. So there's something going on with your connection. If you want a tip to you, when you come back, you can turn off the video and sometimes that will cure it if you want to try that. Because okay. you're frozen right now. So let me come back to you. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're, you're on mute. I can't hear you. There you go. The, hi, how you are? I didn't want the feedback like you told. Uh, no, really. it's okay. <laughs> how you doing? Hi, I'm good. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for all your information because you've been helping me so much these last few weeks that I discovered you and Zach. Sometimes so, I'm yeah. difficult with people, <laughs> but like honestly, like you guys need like that uncle that just tells you the truth. Like that ain't gonna work. Like I That's love what exactly. Crystal's doing, but 
two or three days. Like I'm not guys, I'm not a miracle worker. <laughs> and this is the challenge when you deal with like on market properties. I love the action, but like I've, I don't know. Anyways, let me see what I can help you out with. I, I want everybody to win, but like when I see a very difficult situation, I kind of let them know up front. I'm leaning towards against it, but right. what right. you got? Um, okay. My first question, I have two questions, main questions. One is I'm in uh, the Bronx uh, in New York and wow. I okay. keep hearing from it. I know it's the first thing I always get the Bronx. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, the Bronx. Um, <laughs> The main thing everyone keeps telling me is, oh, I mean, I have real estate, like realtor friends who keep telling me like, oh, this is impossible here. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Like they're very discouraging. And I remember you and Zach saying like, you're going to get that a lot from all the realtors who don't really understand the process. But um, you see my yeah. saying on the screen. Yeah, right there, I know. Right? That's why you were speaking earlier. I was like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, because so, it feels like you're talking to me. Yeah, um, that was so, the first thing. You got to understand. So. By the way, guys, if you ever try to explain to a realtor what a wholesaler is, you might as well just go ahead and tell them how electricity works. Because <laughs> I'm still to this day, like I get the concept, but like when I hit the switch, I could not explain how the rest of it works. And guys, this was created over what, 130 years ago, 150 yeah. years ago, electricity, and we still can't explain it to each other. So my best analogy, when you try to explain wholesaling, especially to a realtor, don't. Right. I buy right. houses for cash. I have cash partners that back me up mm -hmm. and I simply assign the contract over. Mm -hmm. If you say the word wholesaler, they, they are, by the way, NAR in their school, they're already taught wholesalers are bad and they're ruining the business. Mm -hmm. Once you identify yourself as a wholesaler, you're going to get picked on and they're going to be horribly attacked. So yes. don't do it. And so right. you say, did you tell me you're a wholesaler? No, I was just, cause these are just mutual friends of mine. Like yeah. I've known them for years, but, but that's sometimes if you sit down with them. So the only way to explain it to a realtor is when they go, can you explain to me exactly what you do? Right. Because now they're asking you. So it's just like school's a terrible analogy, but like if your friends ask you, like, how did you do that? Right. It means they want to know when, so as opposed to you go, this is how I did it. And they're like, they're not listening to you. Yeah, so when somebody right asks now. you a question like that, that means they're open to receiving the answer. But if you try to shove it down their mouth, mm -hmm. they don't care. Right. So the first thing you have to do is identify in your state is how real estate goes down. Every state's a little bit different. Now, I'm not overly familiar with New York, but I know the rules are different there. I believe uh, it's an attorney state, correct? You got to close yes. with an attorney. That's what she told me. Yes. That's so why she said you, it wouldn't work. <clears throat> That's nuts. So, yeah. So, what you want to do is uh, have you set up a title company? Uh, no, I'm like, I'm talking about newborn kind of new to this. Like, I just well, showed perfect. you guys like no, a this week is ago. Perfect. <laughs> so, I rather teach, listen, I'll teach anybody wholesaling. Right. But the reality is, please don't take everybody else's rules. Right. Because it's all hearsay. It's like it, you can wholesale anywhere in the entire world. Okay. Banks, Huge corporations, they do it to you every day in every of your common business practice, uh, the stuff you guys buy on the counter. Mm -hmm. So your next step is to reach out to a title company. Okay. Um, we have plenty of instructions at freewholesaling.com, anything else you want to do there. And you can find out exactly how to do it. Okay. Um, so, and then if you go on my channel, you go on Flip with Rick, just put in um, interviewing. Uh, I do an excellent video, which is, Probably one of the top rated one, how to interview a um, title company. And the reason you want to do that is there's particular questions you want to get to the heart of the matter so you don't waste your time. Okay. And so people go, well, I want an investor friendly title company. You just need an, a, a title company that says, I have no problem doing an assignment of contract. And they'll tell you exactly how they do it. That's it. That's all I want to do with them. Mm -hmm. But so many people like run their title companies over. So how you find them is I want you to go on social media, Facebook. Mm -hmm. Try an investing group somewhere near the Bronx. Mm -hmm. I just love saying the Bronx, by the way. <laughs> and you guys got all the best shirts and the sayings and the best TV <laughs> shows. And find like in a Bronx uh, real estate investing group there. And then you're going to see the title companies they do business with. And where there's smoke, there's fire. That's where you want to go. 95% of all title companies are built for realtors. Mm -hmm. You don't want that one because it's a nightmare. Right. So by the way, a title company does not have to do an assignment of contract. In fact, a lot of 
title companies are nervous about them because they think it makes them liable. So banks do it to you every day. Big corporations do it to you. I've done over 3000 assignments. I'm telling you, they're 100% legal. You just got to find someone that wants to do business with you and it's okay doing it. Okay. So the best thing to do is start. You can learn wholesaling and then you got to get familiar with in the state you operate. So the best place to start is with a title company and okay. going with an open heart and go, listen, can you just take 10, 15 minutes, try to set an appointment. If you can go in person, it's even better and mm -hmm. get to know people and they're regular people in your community and they want to help you out. Mm -hmm. But if they don't want you there, you'll find out real quick on the phone mm -hmm. and don't waste your time doing it. And right. honestly, that's the easiest place to start to understand. So you understand the theory of wholesaling. Yes. You find distressed homeowners, distressed mm -hmm. properties. You get a great deal on it and you basically sell your contract. That's right. how I explain it to the title companies. Mm -hmm. I spend money, time and energy finding people that are motivated to sell their property at a discount. And then I have a group of investors behind me and then I just assign it. Occasionally I buy some myself, but it depends on the situation. Do you accommodate an investor like me who specializes in assigning? That's it. And you're going to get lit up by some of them and it's okay. Mm -hmm. You just saved yourself because if you From the them, <laughs> it's a nightmare. So just right. start with that because okay. you have to understand and under, don't be surprised if you talk to five or six companies and find one. Your title company is one of the keys in your own comfort when starting in wholesaling because you, you know what you can do. And can do the worst thing you can do is go out and get a motivated seller and they do everything you want them to do and you get the title company like no you can't do that now worst case scenario just so you know even the greatest deal sometimes you have to double close a property do you know what that means yes i do very mm -hmm. simple you close on it and one minute later you sell it again yes. now when i started it used to be the wild west you could do anything you can't do it anymore so mm -hmm. i used to never use it on my mind to do a double close mm -hmm. they call that a dry closing you get in a lot of trouble for that so mm -hmm. um, the worst case scenario, you could do a double closing and you'll cover yourself. Even when people say, oh, wholesaling is illegal here and you can't do it here. Nobody could ever stop you from double closing. Okay. You just got to get better deals if you do that. So talk to your title company. I think it will put all most of those um, fears to rest and mm -hmm. you'll understand how the closing procedure goes. And then I always ask them, if I get it under contract and I had a cash buyer, how long does it take you to run the title mm -hmm. and how soon can you close it? If you go to a traditional realtor title company, mm -hmm. they will wait till the day of closing on your contract and they will never close it one day earlier. Oh, okay. That's what drives me nuts on it. But your title <laughs> company is going to help you with that. So listen, your friends are trying to help you out. Mm -hmm. And now you can now you can come back and educate your friends. Yeah, <laughs> right. I don't know what to do. And here's what I do with every realtor. So you have friends that are realtors, right? Mm -hmm. So the best way to do it is don't wait till they put a property on the market and then chase them down. That's what all wholesalers do. Yeah. Have a talk to them and go, listen, I know you guys deal with a lot of sellers mm -hmm. and I get it for the most, most of the time you solve their problems. But every now and then you get that seller that's somewhat of a train wreck. They need cash right away. The house is in rough shape. Mm -hmm. and you know, it's going to be a pain in the butt because they don't have the money to fix it up. If you have that type of house and they're reasonable in selling it, please call me. I'll give you an offer and I'll pay your full commission. Mm. And if it doesn't work out like no hard feelings. And by the right. way, I don't, ex you do not want your friends, especially realtors calling you every day with a deal. You're doing something wrong. They're going to call you two or three times a year. Okay. And let me tell you what, they have the trust of the seller and they go, listen, we can list that property, but I have a friend that buys these houses for cash. Mm -hmm. And I think it might be a good fit. Let me go back and, Here's the really cool thing about realtors. They know exactly what the seller needs to get rid of the house. Mm -hmm. and they usually don't try to like, so if they need 270, they don't tell you 310. Mm -hmm. They go, they might tell you 270, 275 and you counter them once and then go, listen, I'm going to pay your full commission. So don't beat me up on this type of deal. Right. And a lot of times the seller still pays the commission and they get paid or you pay the commission to do that deal. But train your realtors before the property goes on the market. That is the secret. And if they only call you once or twice a year, you did your job. If they call you every other week, they're going to stop calling you after a month because they think you're going to buy every, uh, every one of their listings for retail and you don't want those mm -hmm. deals. Okay. Tired, nasty properties that need work or the seller just needs it sold now because mm -hmm. they have to take it to market and go find all that stuff and you solve that problem instantly. Okay. And by the way, my first two deals came from exactly doing that exact technique. I was really? clueless how to market but I was really good at sales calls from the corporate world. 
And I went out and talked to every realtor I could. And I found uh, a brand new realtor. She was an older lady. And she's like, hey, my mom's got this house. It's really dated. They've had it 40 years. I don't know what to do with it. I was supposed to put it on the market. Um, maybe this would be a good fit. And I just went and looked at it with her. And we struck up a deal. And yeah. I made 10000 Here's the Ooh. funny part is the guy that bought it from me fixed it up six or nine months later, made $350,000 off of me. Ooh, but God. I was fine with it. I still made my right, money. Right. I proved the theory. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, just by doing that strategy. So I've given you enough information to handle your realtor friends. Yes. And then make sure you go to a title company and get the real facts. Okay. And don't shame your friends of like, oh, I can do it. I told you. Like, it doesn't work that way. Oh, just, no, no, oh, no, no, no. I, I appreciate mm -hmm. Realtors give me bad information all the time. Wholesalers give bad information all the time. I'm fighting all trying. the way. <laughs> so remember, your friends are trying to help you, and they come yes. usually from a place of love, but they don't understand what you do. And right. only explain what you do when they ask you. Right. you. Don't use the word wholesaler. Just say, listen, I buy houses for cash, usually problematic properties or people who need to sell their house fast. Mm -hmm. Do you know anybody like that? Or I tell you what, if it ever comes up, please call me. I think I could make it really easy for you. And remember, what does a realtor want at the end of the day whenever they deal with real estate? money <laughs> they just want their commission i don't yeah, blame them it. i want yeah, money of course too. so like do? go to what they want and cut all the crap out because they don't care about the rest right and if you do what you say and it makes it work then it's fine remember realtors are kind of like the the like a client has a lawyer mm -hmm. realtors really they bond that relationship and you can't get in between that so you utilize the the realtor's relationship with the client go listen what number they need to get rid of this property so a lot of the training i teach at free wholesaling you can use the same psychology and verbiage. Hey, what do they need to get out of it, Janet? Like, seriously. Right. And go, listen, I'm going to make this seamless, but like, you got to cut me to the truth. Mm -hmm. Because without it, you got to spend two or three hours with these clients trying to get through it. She's going to get paid anyways. You might as well just utilize their services. So, right. What else you got? My second question was um, regarding family who knows you're broke and you're trying to help them sell a house. Because <laughs> my aunt, I have an aunt, like a distant aunt who okay. needs to get rid of a property that she's like super desperate to get rid of. And I was like thinking about, you know, approaching her and asking her if I could help her, you know, get, get it. Why not? But I'm no, like if I approach her, how would you approach them? Like, should I just sell them that simply? Like I could help you find a buyer. Or you have a good relationship like with your aunt. Oh yeah. She's, she's a beautiful. Person. Is it the same state or is it close by? Uh, she's here. She's in New York too. Help so, her out. Does yeah. the, does the property have issues? Um, as far as I know, I think it's just like a maintenance thing because I know it's um it's within a, like a a little town like she she has like a like a place that she goes to the beach like, it's like yeah. a beach house put it that way she doesn't live in it full time so it's like a vacation spot or a little family listen spot if if has. so always listen to the seller's first desires even if it's family mm -hmm. so does she say listen I just want to get rid of this property. Yeah, she's been talking about it for a while and she was like trying to debate whether she should keep it in the family and such. But I was first thing I thought was, wait, I'm learning about this. I say, wait, that might be my yeah. first check. Listen, I, help family. I help family <laughs> so, all the time. But and, I was just uh, concerned on how to approach her if she knows I, I don't have money to buy a house. You know, like how she's going to look at me like, oh, you going to buy my house? You're broke. You know, that kind well, of thing. You, you, so, you know the answer to this, right? Like, I don't know how to approach them. You have cash partners you work with. Right. And if the prices, if if it makes sense, it's easy to bring somebody into the equation. If she wants okay. full retail mm -hmm. and she needs the services of a realtor and there's okay. a trade. So usually with family, you can do a soft approach. Mm -hmm. You can find out what the property's worth, do the numbers, start running it. Okay. And then you could just do a joint venture with them and help them out. Like mm. it's, listen, I help out family all the time with real estate. I don't even make a dime off of it. Okay. But honestly, if I was in the beginning, I probably would have to make something to validate what I'm doing. And it actually right. is a great teacher to you. Now I'm going to warn you guys. Sometimes family just ain't worth it. Like there is just, mm -hmm. if you have one of those tumultuous relationships, don't mix it because it becomes problematic. I have walked away with right. properties within the family, but if she wants to get rid of it, the house mm -hmm. is not the prettiest type of thing. And it fits kind of like the wholesale mode mm -hmm. and just partner up with it and help her out with it. Now okay. you're not a licensed realtor, but <clears throat> they can pay you a marketing fee. Okay. And you have an agreement with her. And then sometimes just by you helping servicing calls, <clears throat> finding cash buyers, you're doing her a huge favor. So a lot of times I'll say to go, listen, at the end of the day, what do you truly expect the net from the property? Right. And just work backwards from that number and help it out. Now, okay. you don't want to be a realtor either. So you're looking for that cash buyer that's going to move quickly. And right. honestly, you might 
ask yourself, does it really need a cash buyer or could you uh, have a buyer to get financing? Because if you could get a buyer with financing, you'd probably get more money for the property. Oh. I just don't want you to acting as a realtor, but yeah, no. if you have a vested interest with a family member, then no one's, they really can't question you. So the only challenge is here is they typically got to pay you outside the HUD. So you mm -hmm. just have to have that agreement with them. And that's okay. a family thing. And I can't tell you how to do that one because it's a All little right. bit tricky. Yeah. But um, yeah, if you're going to help them out, why not? Like I, I've done it all the time with family. Like it's a pain in the butt answering phone calls because yeah. you're kind of being realtor and investor at the same time. But mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the situation is. So I would have an honest conversation mm -hmm. and just start with a net number. And she goes, well, you know, if I was going to get 250 and you're like, well, you know, so the average closing cost is going to be about 10 to 12 percent okay. just to kind of give you some round numbers so when you talk to her you don't have to get in the weeds on it run an right. arv and just figure out some numbers and see what the house needs to repair and if it's a win-win for both parties do it if she wants you to work for free doesn't want to pay you a dime don't do it and if she has an unrealistic expectation give her to a realtor okay Make Thank sense? you so much. Yes, 100%. Sometimes family is challenging, but you know the relationship. I can't tell you how to do that. And you're yeah. going to have to dive in and kind of figure that part out. But um, yeah, it works. My, my mom gave me one of my best deals of my life and she didn't even know what I did. Really? She paid my, my son just buys houses for cash. Wow. And she threw a probate in my lap. And I'm just like, I can't believe I sold it. My God. Wow. I, it, was, it was just, it was the easiest, one of the easiest deals I ever did. And it was at a time I just needed it. So if you guys ever went to that struggle, you know what I'm talking about. And it just kickstarted me. I think I bought like 40 houses that year. Wow. And I was kind of down in the dumps. Like, and then I remember just talking to my mom. I'm like, yeah, I buy. she goes, what do you do one day? I go, mom, I just buy houses for cash. <laughs> do you know anybody? And apparently that conversation stuck with her. And from that, I took my mom on a, like a week long cruise. I think a 10 day cruise to Alaska with the whole family. Was last. So um, if you have that relationship with your family, great. If not, like keep your distance, so to speak. So okay. if it's a win-win, go ahead and do it. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. I okay. appreciate you all of your help. Okay. Hope to speak to you soon. Take care. Okay. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Uh oh. Let's see here. You know, I guess you guys know I'm bad with a computer, right? Okay. Okay. Let me keep moving. I had a couple questions online here, and I'm going to jump back on some people here. Uh, Okay, so I was talking to Joshua earlier. He bounced off. We had some internet issues. He says, Rick, uh, my internet messed up. How do we deal with buyers that keep changing their buy box? I get these things they're looking for, then they back out when I get it. Um, Joshua, most likely, it's not going to be a serious buyer. But if they constantly change their buy box, they're scared to death to buy the property, and they probably didn't give you a proof of fund. So, um, some people make changes over time and that's normal. But if they change every time when you present them a deal, it means they're not a serious buyer and you need to heed the warning. So um, let's see here. Okay. Uh, let me see. I got somebody spamming me. I had to fix that. Um, the mic drop session. That's funny. Juan, you there? Juan. Yep. Juan's coming on here. What's going on, Juan? Hey, what's going on, brother? Good, man. What can I help you out with? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you perfectly. Yeah, so um, I just had a quick question, man, because um, I'm in Orange County, California. So I know, you know, from the past when I was doing it here in my area, uh, mostly Orange County and L.A., I wasn't having great success. Uh, so I did switch market, out my to, friend. you know, a, a couple places. Yeah, yeah, super tough. Yeah, I mean, you um, know, so, they have an entire you know, TV show about Orange County on uh, <laughs> on A and E. It's like crazy. It's like, yeah, is it really like that in Orange County? Yeah, yes. Um, yeah, I, I would say this. It's it's like like South like so it's it's pretty big. I mean, it's like uh, close to four million for the county alone, and then we're crazy. about uh, thirty minutes from 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 downtown LA. 
So we're not too far from, you know, from, from LA, uh-huh. but just the county alone, there's like close to 4 million. Uh, so a lot of cities here, especially like Anaheim, they're like, you know, in the 600, like 500,000, you know, population. So it's a lot of cities that are pretty, pretty decent size, you know? Uh, but yeah, it, for the most part, even in the, in the ghetto, like in one of the cities that's, you know, the most crime ridden, um, you get houses that are like three twos that are like pretty much falling apart and they're going for five, like 500 on the low end, 700 on the high end. And, you know, they're pretty shitty. So, I mean, that's kind of like what, what you see. Mostly everything is about over a million for sure. Yeah. But I did have a question on that. Uh, I did notice since I am here in the, in, in the city uh, called Santa Ana, which they have the main uh, court. So this is where they do probate. So I'm about five minutes away from there. I do work a full-time job. And I noticed that there's not a lot of people going for probate um, from my area, from what I've been seeing. So since there is a mix of, you know, um, pretty much everything, million dollar homes. And also, you know, you have those lower end. It's still a lot for, you know, just the general, general, you know, uh, overall from, from, you know, the U.S., but yeah. I mean, for for this for this area, it makes it makes sense. So I have had you know some success on going there. Uh, my wife is actually helping me out, so she's going every Monday to to get the list. So she we kind of looked at it for the last two weeks, and there's about eighty ish a month uh, cases that are that are posted through probate. So we just started. So so I sent out my first batch of uh you know the the mailers. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that was about a week ago. So my, my question to you, right. Since I've kind of noticed that there's not a lot of people actually going to the, to the court. I mean, it's basically dead. Every time we've gone, it's like, there's almost nobody in the probate court. Um, and it was pretty easy to get the stuff there. Um, so I know it's very competitive when it comes to, you know, trying to wholesale here, but would you suggest, since I'm noticing that there is not a lot of competition for probate in this area, and it, and I do have it really close by, and she is helping me out, um, how would you tackle that if I do get something coming in? Like, that, that's kind of where I'm so a you, little it, stuck on. So probates are off-market properties, and a lot of times um, mm-hmm. someone's passed away in the family. I don't know about L.A. They keep everything up over there. But um, if you find a property that's older, and in that type of condition, you should mm-hmm. easily be able to find a cash buyer because your market's so hyper. The challenge is, so I love the probate aspect. I, I think you're dead on with it. And honestly, it's the only way I would even attack your market that because foreclosures are beaten to death mm-hmm. in your county. It's a waste of time, in my opinion. And you're you're in mm-hmm. the one of the most densely populated, yeah, definitely. highest cost living area. So I would do the probates because you're not going to go broke mm-hmm. doing it. And you can get a shot at an off-market property, hopefully with not a lot of competition by being the first person, because a lot of people don't like to do the probates. Mm -hmm. Your challenge is, the reality is, if you're talking about houses in the million dollar price points, a lot of these sellers are somewhat sophisticated and they like to go to realtors and brokers. And I can't fix that. So here's the Mm -hmm. key with probates is don't do it for 30 days and quit. Do it the rest of the Mm -hmm. year and then make your decision because- this is not a one-off. So I'm in very small counties who do probates. We get maybe two calls a month. It's competitive here, but mm. they are monsters, man. We make huge profits off of them because a lot of times you can get someone call me, go, listen, um, we just want to get an offer on the house. You connect with them, you build a rapport and you kind of like, they don't go out to 15 other people. If you can find that type of person, the only place you're ever going to find them is in a probate. So do it. Just don't do it in 30 days and quit. Mm. Because if that's your expectation, you're going to get disappointed. It is a long-term play. Now, the cool thing is it's not expensive. It's local. Mm. And you've already figured out some of the hard parts. So do it. As opposed to stepping Mm. up your wholesaling game, I would find a virtual market outside of Orange County, hands down. And me and Zach have shot so many videos. And we've done recent ones to point you in the right markets. You can reverse engineer any other wholesaler success and you need to find houses at that 250 mm-hmm. or below mark because, and by the way, you can do it virtually. It's a little bit more challenging to do it virtually, but it's a lot better than sitting in your backyard waiting to try to flip a million dollar house because you're going to hear crickets. 
it's yeah. challenging because there's so many people yeah. chasing it. So guys, a virtual, mm -hmm. it's, it's been around for a little bit now. So people are learning to chase the money with technology and having a more global economy. So you should do the exact same thing. It works, guys. I do deals all over the country and I never leave my studio. How do I do that? Why? I teach you guys how to find them. You guys partner up with me and we all make money. You can do the exact same thing. It takes two to three months to get established in a virtual market. But here's the best part is you pick the market out. There's parts of Kentucky, mm -hmm. Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia. All these areas are wonderful. Like I've done entire videos on them. Guys, I'm in these markets. I do it. I'm just telling you. The only reason I do Florida is because I live here and I love it here and I love the ocean and the water in my family. But if I had to pick to do this market, it's like suicide. It's expensive. We are approaching California status yeah. quickly. But I started out here. They were a lot cheaper. So I cut my teeth on low uh, low cost properties because I was in Florida at the time. I was just lucky in the right place at the right time. Going forward now, if I was in Florida and I was just yeah. starting out, like Crystal said here, I would go in Tennessee because you can get 220, 230 all day long, really nice houses. And all you got to find people that are in distress that need to sell it. Remember, guys, we create win-win situations. So do probate in your backyard exactly what you're doing and stick it out till the end of the year. And then go find a virtual yeah, market so and actually, have fun uh, with it. Actually, I, I did take your advice, too, from uh, four months ago. And you, you and Zach, uh, so I actually have been doing virtual in a city in, 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 um, in Tennessee. And I, I kind of been sticking it out, you know, doing the calls myself on my spare time because I do have a, a sales job um, mm -hmm. full time. So I do this on my spare time since I'm working from home. And I actually came up on a, a pretty cool little property in, in Tennessee. And um, I'm working on, on the on this two deal, um, you know, uh, uh, his, his parents have passed away right mm -hmm. next door. And then he's trying to sell it because he's retiring. So it, it's one of those, that uh, I'm pretty close to it. So, uh, most likely I'm going to be able to sign, sign the purchase agreement this week. So I'm, I am trying to, you know, still so stick it you out already, with, you already uh, have a market stuff, and then just go in. in and guys, yeah. listen, yeah. you can reverse engineer yeah. any cash uh, any wholesalers um, cash buyers list. Cause most wholesalers brag about how many cash buyers they have. Go ahead and be one of those and get on their list. Reverse engineering. It's not hard to figure this stuff out, but you being in orange County, do the probates. Yeah. And then I would expand in that market. You already looks like you're going to get a deal in, but you got to stick out the probates. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm definitely, yeah. I, I just wanted to reach out to you. Cause I, I'm like, ah, oh, man, I even do the probates here in Orange County, but I, I would sense. do it. I mean, there's still like a lot of cities. Yeah. And remember, guys, always oh, do your local yeah, market. Always up. be active because you're there. You have friends. You have family. Eventually, you will find a property. It's a timing issue. And if you're trained and you know the market and you know how to pull down a deal, you can take it down. You're just not going to do five to seven in some of these very, very expensive markets because logistically, it's somewhat of a challenge, mm -hmm. especially being new. So. Okay, Juan, yeah. you got anything okay, else? Cool, I got to help some well, people out here. It. Okay, bud, I'll talk to you. Antoine, you there? How you doing? Good, man. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm all right. I just had a couple I, questions. Go ahead. Guys, we didn't so, we uh, even talk about basketball today with the, uh, the NCAA. is crazy this year, man. Mm. Nuts. Go ahead. Yeah. You tell him I'm a well, Miami uh, fan. It's so I'm so embarrassed that our basketball program is so much better than our football program, but I am proud because what those guys did, that is not an easy feat. So go ahead, man. Uh, basically, uh, how fast do you contact probates after the file? Because I, I've been doing them monthly, yeah, and I find that a lot of investors contact uh, some of these people. So once they file the probate, it's fair game because you got to understand. I'm not a big fan of chasing people down on obituaries because you, usually obituaries are within a week of a death. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever had, listen, we've all had death of like, it's, it's just part of life. It's hard, man. Like the last thing you want to do is negotiate a contract when you're grieving the loss of someone. So 
Most people file a probate within 30 to 60 days, probably closer to 45 days after the death of a person. And so the problem is I like to respect people. I was actually very conservative when I started and I found out the hard way, the longer I wait, the worse my odds got. So once they file the probate, because it's somewhat of a public record, they've got to understand that people are going to notice. So you might as well just try to contact them first and try to connect with them because the problem is when two or three realtors contact them and then two or three investors, and then you wait, try to be the nice guy and wait another 30 days. Yeah. You're kind of, you're kind of done. Now, occasionally it might work for you. I'm like, Hey, thanks Antoine so much for respecting me and not running me over the day we posted the, the probate. But, uh, I found out the hard way, dude, you keep in mind for the longest time, I refused to do a cold call on a probate because I thought it was like ambulance chasing. Dude, I was wrong. Like, I was really bad about it. And I had a 17-year-old kid explain it to me, my son. He goes, dude, dad, just call them. You're getting beat. I don't know. It's not respectful. Dude, the kid took down nine probates in like a four-month period. And we changed the whole way we did it. So we do the cold calling. I call it warm calling. And we do the letter. And we make them opposite. So one... Um, one I would do under my name and the other one I would do under my son's or one I would do under my name and one I do under a company name. And it's kind of like the McDonald's and Burger King approach. Like some people like, like, so I like the fries at McDonald's. I don't know what they do to those fries. I'm sure it's not good for me. And then I like the Whopper at BK. I like their uh, fish sandwich too, but it's like some people just prefer McDonald's. Some prefer Burger King. And here's what a lot of them say. They go, Mr. Rick, I am so glad you wrote me that letter because I think it's so bad when people sit there and call me and I will never do business with someone and cold call me from the death of a family member. And then I get the opposite. I'm so glad you called me because I would have never had the guts to call you off of a letter or anything. So why I have you on the phone, let me discuss it. Right. That's it. Don't try to look in the philosophy of it because a lot of this doesn't make it. Once that probate's out there, it means everybody has the fair right to chase it. Whoever gets to it first, and connects with them naturally wins end of story. So I've tried, I tried another one where I tried to pull six months of probates when I first started mm. dude, nightmare. I, I spent so much time like trying to mail and call and I never, and they, most of them are like, Oh, I wish you called me a month ago. I already struck a deal with an investor. I'm like, Ugh. so speed does kill in probates. I know that's an oxymoron statement, but it is true. Do it as soon as you can and don't try to rash out. Once they file it, that's it. Now I get people go, well, Rick, should I call off the obituaries? I'm like, dude, have a heart. Like that's a little rough to me, but some people are like big on that. I think it's just very ice cold to do that. Like guys, I want to help people. I don't want to aggravate people. So, but you do have to aggravate them like to a point. And trust me, I get called. I've been called every name in the book because I did all the probate calls the first uh, year and a half. Meaning I did all the letters, all the inbound calls, and boy, I got called some nasty stuff. Whatever. Like, I don't care what people think. I really don't. And you know what? If you don't want to do it, just hang up and move on with your life. I'm not going to bother you. So with probates, when they tell me I don't want to hear from you anymore, I end it. Like, I don't play games with people in probate. Okay. I look at it like if it was my family member, I'd want them to treat me the exact same way. And that's how you have to look at it. So just pretend your mom, your aunt, hopefully you have a good relationship with them. Um, but speed man like get to it as fast as you can because sometimes do you ever notice like sometimes whoever connects with the person first they usually win because people are like loyal by human nature like oh i've already talked to antoine and if antoine doesn't buy the house i'll call you back that's typically right. how people go through the progression unless they want to deal specifically with a realtor which there's not much i can do for those does that help you out you yeah. got to move fast as you can I tried. If in the perfect world, I'd take six months of probate and I'd just rip through them. You won't get anywhere doing that. It's you're going to have to do like thousands of them to get through that because most of the properties are already contracted or they're sold and it's too late. So remember, I'm trying to beat the lawyer because the lawyers just get in the way in a probate for me. I find yeah. lawyers the most annoying thing in a probate because I don't need the lawyer's permission to do a probate. I just need him to push his little paperwork, him or her. And, uh, so if you get the consent of the, uh, the PR, the executor in a probate, the lawyer just has to go and do their job. I don't ever want to talk to the lawyer. I, they always screw up a deal. 
So the only way I can do that is I have to get to the PR sooner than later. Okay. And by the way, a lot of PRs like, well, I'm going to run it by my lawyer. I'm like, okay. And then like we wait and like a week or two will go by because lawyers do everything on their own time and get frustrated. They go, listen, I'm just going to sign it. I'll just have my lawyer. I'll give it to him later. Okay. Okay. You can't do it without speed. Okay. And uh, what else you got? I, I got a question about. So I still work a full time job. So uh, after I get off, then I do my cold calling. So I don't really have time to drop the dollars during the week. So I do that on the weekends. And on a good day, I can get about five hundred to six hundred leads. Mm-hmm. But I find that if I do reverse drop the dollars, it slows me down quite well, a bit. You know what? At the end of the day, Tony, you got to do what works best for you. So the fact that you're working a full time job and like, I always tell people, don't jump off the ship. If you have obligations and you need to do some base, like keep rent paid, your mortgage, whatever it is, quitting your job and going full time wholesaling with like no leads or no nothing is usually creates so much anxiety and fear. It, to me, it's not worth it. So. I had obligations. I had to do it. So I worked almost seven and a half months, to be honest with you, right around eight. And I did it. And honestly, um, I worked a lot. So I had a job. It was 10, 10 and a half hours. And then I had little babies <laughs> and I had a wife and it was exhausting. And uh, mm-hmm. but I, I just I wanted to give it a shot. So if it reverse driving for dollars doesn't work for you, then it's fine. Like pick what's going to work best for you, because like at the end of the day, you do have to have some downtime. And you didn't get in this business to like never see the light of day. There's got to be a light at the end of the tunnel. So gravitate towards the stuff. Not that's easy, but that's being productive and effective. And if reverse driving for dollars is slowing you down. And by the way, reverse driving for dollars is not that easy because you got to figure out the logistics of it. And it takes a lot of timing and planning. And that's where you're getting hung up on. And I, I agree with you because you have other obligations. So you have to prioritize and find What's going to be the most effective for you? So if it's stri- strictly cold calling, I agree with you. I'm not here to fight you on it. I find yeah, reverse I found- dollars in theory, it's great and it works, but it does yeah. take a lot of time and planning. And sometimes if you're working an eight or 10 hour a day job, you only have so much time, throw kids on top of that. All other taking care of like older family members, which I do. It's challenging, guys. And so I don't want you to choke yourself out. That's not the purpose. You got to still have somewhat of a life. But you are making the sacrifice because you're basically working two jobs. And one, you're kind of learning on the fly. Mm. Yeah. The last couple of weeks, I've been uh, splitting it up. So Saturday, I'll do reverse drop for dollars on the probates. And then mm. on Sunday, I'll just do my regular drop for dollars. Yeah. Uh, so 500 leads a week. Is that enough that... I could probably make something happen. Well, I mean, it doesn't really matter as much as it takes. Listen, you get as much as you can. There is no limit. You can, by the way, I'll repeat myself. You can never have enough leads. The question yeah. is, at what point does the quality of your life, like, it just gets to the point where it's just nothing's fun. And listen, we're all humans. Like, we have to have a life. And especially when you have kids, you have to set some time aside because kids don't understand what you're doing. So I was fortunate if my kids were young enough when I put in that hard two years and my wife helped me make sacrifices. But boy, dude, Saturday, Saturday was go day for me. 10, 12 hours minimum out. Either I was meeting with a client or I was finding a lead or I was on the phone with someone. I never let one hour go to waste on Saturday. Sunday was like a half day. I had to do that. And sometimes they were all day. But you just got to kind of press the gas pedal and find things that work within you. You can't do anything if you're working a job and doing it. So you got to find the stuff that you're making progress with. And sometimes you do a certain technique or a lead generation and it just doesn't work. And I get it. Then get rid of it and find the stuff that you have the most confidence with and just keep on going. Okay. Because the thing I is that, yeah, it actually works. Like when I've been doing a probate, I've gotten more leads than I usually do call calling list. Yeah. And I tell everyone you can do probates and have a full time job and it won't even it's not very taxing. That's why I tell everybody to do it because it you won't broke. And number two, it doesn't take a lot of time because I'm calling you. It's when you go on the offensive doing driving for dollars, reverse driving for dollars, and cold calling on government list, you're gonna have to prioritize your time. So you just gotta find 
the best way to go and drive yourself completely crazy and just go nuts on Saturday. Because like I looked at Saturday like three full days. I would start really early. I would set yeah. my day up. I got all the leads. And then I knew who I was going to see. And then I have three hours of just calling everybody on follow-ups. And then I left like the last three hours to catch anybody that called me back that I could visit the last minute. Because I find Saturday one of the best days to do any type of physical appointments or virtual appointments. Because people are open. They're not working as much, especially the second half of the day. Yeah. Okay. You got it. Just come up with a plan with it. And just speed kills with probates. So remember that. Okay. okay? All right. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So, guys, do me a favor. If you enjoyed today's live, please make sure you smash that freaking like button because it makes a difference. And as always, please make sure you subscribe to this channel. I got some really cool videos dropping that I only put on this channel. So make sure you subscribe to the Rick in channel. Make sure you check out us on flip with Rick it means that go live every Thursday at I think it's 1 PM Eastern time. I don't think we've changed it. And that is the plus best place to get a hold of us guys. If you have a deal you want to submit, go over to um, sellmypaper.com. I know I didn't pop it up there, but um, you know where to find it. And as usual guys, I appreciate your time. This is a great place for us to interact. Um, Zach will be on, um, I believe Wednesday, and then I'll be back on him with Thursday and make sure you tune in this channel. We do lots of videos and I'm trying to up the content to give you the best quality information so you guys can be successful at, at wholesaling. So guys go out there and get a deal. And remember, you got to have a life while you're wholesaling. I believe in you. You are just going to have to make some sacrifices. I want you to learn from the things that are holding people back from being successful wholesalers. I taught you in the beginning of this video. If you missed it, go back to the very beginning, especially if you just tuned in at the end of this video.